Um, my name is Brian Donegan. I'm from the Isle of Man. Have we got um, anybody here who's been to the Isle of Man, apart from people who live there? Ah, excellent, excellent. Can anybody tell me the name of the major sporting event that's just completed this year on the Isle of Man? <laughs> Cricket, no. <laughs> Any other takers? Yeah, one at the back. Motorcycles. Motorcycles, hey, very good. TT. TT races, where the population of the Isle of Man doubles uh, over the TT fortnight. A fantastic um, motorcycling <coughs> spectacle for anybody who hasn't, uh, hasn't been there. Okay. I'm conscious of time, Lewis, um, so I, I'll try and, and rattle through this as quickly as, as possible so you can uh, catch up. So, uh, let's talk a bit about the Isle of Man. I want to talk, um, I represent the Isle of Man government. Um, we've been very, very busy on the digital front with e-gaming over the last 15 years, but latterly with digital currencies. So I want to touch on those two topics over the next few minutes and give you a little insight into why we've had those successes. So, Isle of Man, um, not a million miles away from us, it's between Ireland and England. And a population of 85,000 people, we're a British Crown dependency, just like the Channel Islands, the same status. Um, we're 227 square miles, 23 miles long, and 13 miles wide. A um, little bit of background in terms of our fiscal position. We've no national debt, we've definitely won summer rating with Moody's we're very proud of. And we've had 30 years of continuous growth, um, so not bad for a, a small nation. Uh, we're OECD quite listed, so a, a, a significant tick in the box for us. Uh, but significantly, we have a, um, a very well-established financial services industry that was 39% of GDP before uh, Lehman's. Um, now it's uh, a few basis points below that, uh, running at about 35% of GDP. So. Um, for a nation that has such a large financial services uh, dependency, it probably makes sense to diversify the economy. Um, and I'm going to tell you a little bit about that diversification in a second. Zero corporation tax, tax, no capital gains tax. What I want to do is tell you a little bit about e-gaming and, and why e-gaming. So define e-gaming. So e-gaming is gambling online. So Isle of Man government about 15 years ago, decided to get involved in this space. Why? Because it's, it's digital, uh, it's a thing of the future, lots of job creation, lots of revenue, but some risk. So what's the risk? The risk is to reputation. So what are you going to do about that? Well, what we decided to do about that was to mitigate the risk by doing two things. We were going to put it in place the best of breed regulatory environment that we could create, and we were going to put in place a fiscal regime with zero corporate tax as the, as the main attraction. But there were a number of other things that we found ourselves at the center of in terms of attractiveness. That was fantastic telecoms interconnectivity, masses of bandwidth, and a selection of data centers. And we produce all our own power from natural gas supplies in the Isle of Man. And even better still, we send all of our excess power through fiber optic cabling to the UK national grid. So some really good blending of benefits there that actually make the Isle of Man an attractive place for businesses. What happened? Over a very short period of time, we found uh, the establishment of a cluster for e-gaming. So we had poker stars established in the Isle of Man, microgaming, playtech, to name but a few. In the intervening years, we've now grown that to 15% of our GDP. So in the space of 10 years, a new industry has actually grown to 15% of GDP. Fantastic success story by any measure. Currently employing 900 people, fantastic. So, about a year ago, uh, we started to get some inquiries from the digital currency world. And why? Because we didn't actively chase it. Digital currency world was saying, there's a convergence going on between e-gaming and digital currencies. So, we'd like to come to the other map, please. And we said, yeah, let's have a think about that. So it all started to seem a little bit like 10 years before. So we said, yeah, lots of jobs, lots of revenue. What are we going to do? So we said, risk mitigate, because there's potential risk here. So what are you going to do? <coughs> so we put in place a regime to uh, have the best of breed regulations for digital currencies in the Isle of Man. We promised that uh, last June 2014. 
government came out with an announcement <coughs> that said that it thought that digital currencies were a really good thing, provided they were used correctly. So from our perspective, we made, as a government, made a commitment to introduce legislation that would actually address the needs of that industry. And last March 2015, we introduced the Proceeds of Crime Act Schedule 4, which addressed the AML issues, and introduced the Designated Businesses Bill, which is intended to give our regulator, the Financial Supervision Commission, uh, the uh, oversight of the books and records of all new entrants coming into the Isle of Man. We're just waiting to get all of that uh, regulation enshrined in our uh, local economy, and uh, that's expected in the next four to eight weeks. Uh, as soon as that happens, we expect us to, as a government, move into the next phase, which is to uh, discuss with all the major banks mm -hmm. the needs and aspirations of the blockchain businesses that are in the island and the exchange businesses that are in the island and how we're going to get them to move forward. Because clearly, banking services is absolutely fundamental, uh, a fundamental need. So, <coughs> What can I tell you in relation to some of the uh, developments? So I've talked about the correct legislation, the right home for the business. So e-gaming, I think it's widely recognized for those of you in the room who understand and work with e-gaming, that the Isle of Man has a first class regulatory uh, reputation. Currently in the Isle of Man we have 55 license holders, a lot of gaming software. I mentioned Poker Stars, Microgaming, Playtech are all headquarters there. And digital currency, so our approach. So we've taken the lead in this emerging technology. We believe in a controlled <coughs> way. We said last year that we, we thought that digital currencies were a good thing provided they were used correctly but crucially we wanted to protect the consumer and keep crime out and that's what we believe we've actually done with these new regulations that i've, I've described to you so we've addressed the kml we've addressed the kyc and the anti-terror piece so we want to ensure that companies are going to be well run, well managed, well funded, with experienced and knowledgeable staff. Last year, uh, we had our own conference in the Isle of Man called the Crypto Valley Summit. Very, very successful. We had a significant number of people off island uh, attending. <coughs> Block blockchain technology, which is obviously why we're here today, was very much the, at the core of that. Banking was an issue back then, it's still an issue. And we've announced uh, for October this year, uh, Crypto Valley uh, Summit 2015. So increasingly we're finding people are saying, Isle of Man is the new world capital for blockchain technologies. And clearly, I think it is. Um, so I'm going to be shamelessly self-promotional here and say to you that we have a significant number of businesses on the Isle of Man right now. Some are in the exchange space, but the vast majority of the pipeline that we're seeing is coming from the blockchain space. So we see that very much as a specific, designated, specialized software development businesses doing smart things with information layers on the blockchain. And we're very, very happy to support that. So from our perspective, we think that Isle of Man was, was first to market as a government. Uh, many of you might have seen the technical trial that we announced several weeks ago. Uh, we were using the technology, the blockchain technology in government to actually put all of the uh, companies that are coming in on our register on the blockchain. So it's a, just a, a way for us as a government to get the message out to the wider blockchain community that we're open for business. But we're really after the premium end of business. We want to attract the premium end of the business because that's good for jobs, it's good for revenue, and it allows us to mitigate our risk fairly significantly. Currently, we have in the blockchain community on the Isle of Man, somewhere in the order of about 23, 24 people full-time employed. That seems small, but it's perfectly formed as a community. That's about 12, 13 businesses, and it's growing rapidly. 
one of those just recently announced very significant VC funding from a Californian VC. So we're obviously doing the right things the right way around. So in terms of, of summary then, um, what have we achieved in the digital currency space? I think we've, we've confirmed the premier position of the Isle of Man, I think, in this space. It's an investment grade jurisdiction. We've achieved early mover advantage. We've definitely affected the premium in the market. Uh, we've, as I mentioned, companies established. And we've also got an incubator environment now established for startups. There's a big convergence going on between e-gaming and digital currencies and blockchain. And we're happy as a government to encourage that further. So in terms of a jurisdiction, safe home for your intellectual property, tax efficient environment, strong reputation of the government and the regulator, lots of opportunities for growth. It's a big island. And how can we work with you? We welcome startup companies, and we can provide the corporate intellectual property computing and taxation environment to help you maximize your, your business potential. I'm lucky to have some colleagues uh, from the Isle of Man with me in the room today, um, so hopefully you'll be able to uh, meet and discuss any needs that you might have. Um, Simon Kelly from Descartes is in the audience. Would you care to stand up, Simon? Yeah, uh, Simon, Simon is with us, so anybody that wants to talk about Tax efficiency of the structures, Simon will be able to able to assist. <coughs> Stable economic and political environment. And we can provide the entrepreneurial spirit that enables our economy to grow. Um, that's it for me for now. I, I, I'm going to hand over to my colleague Nick Williamson from Pythia. Um, Nick's a um, serial entrepreneur, he's running a successful uh, business in the island. Uh, so Nick's going to take you through uh, his story and then we're going to take some Q&A at the end. Okay, thank you. Alright, well, um, thanks Brian. Uh, as Brian said, I am currently building a company with a few other people uh, in both in the audience and elsewhere in London, um, uh, building uh, blockchain technology. And we're really, what we're building is a base blockchain layer that you can build um, built to purpose blockchains that, uh, that um, allow um, specific business logic to be implemented on top of a um, very agnostic uh, base protocol layer. And so one of the first things that we'll be launching is actually with the Isle Man government, this pilot program for this crypto company registry. And it's, it's interesting because um, we, we initially chose the project because it was going to be a very green field, very, um, um, very easy project to get all the necessary approvals and to actually implement technically. But it, it actually has shown to have some uh, longer ranging implications, I think, through some future projects that can stem from that. Once you start onboarding companies onto a registry and you uh, are um, able to maintain and store data about these companies, you can start doing very interesting things with uh, Know Your Business uh, in areas that uh, where you really need that sort of stuff like uh, supply chain financing or even just supply chain management. Um, it's it's very much baby steps, but it's um, sort of the first baby steps that we need to be able to take to be able to start putting some of those bigger pieces together. Um, so I, I first came over to the Isle Man uh, to work for PokerStars, which Brian mentioned. I think of the 13 and a half percent, PokerStars is actually uh, something like 9 percent, uh, which is a pretty significant um, um, portion of uh, any, any economy, even a small one. Um, and so it's been really great to um, see how the government and how the regulatory framework has really enabled that growth and that safety and the consumer protection where um, in, in many other jurisdictions or in many of the more gray market jurisdictions, uh, we saw the e-gaming world be right 
fraud and with uh, malfeasance and just uh, straight up theft in a lot of cases. And so it's been great to be able to, um, to, to be able to experience the exact opposite of that. Um, and that's one of the reasons that now that I am working on a blockchain company and working on blockchain technology, it is really exciting to be able to um, help build up that same sort of thing in conjunction with government and industry uh, for blockchain itself. As we've, uh, just like with the e-gaming industry back in the late 90s and early 2000s, we currently do see a lot of fraud. We've seen a lot of uh, what are termed exit scams or um, uh, hacks and, and bad <coughs> actors who have entered the cryptocurrency space. And we really need to um, find a way to um, make sure that we can provide those services that um, that you can, I, I know the whole point of blockchain is you're not, not supposed to have to trust anybody, but at the same time at the edges, uh, you really do need to be able to have that confidence in those on-ramps and off-ramps uh, to where um, you, you can be sure that you, you can be comfortable actually engaging with this technology. Um, so I'll actually keep it fairly short because um, I think we're going to um, both Brian and myself field some questions uh, if anybody has any questions about uh, the Isle Man or um, just government and blockchain in general. Thanks. Can I just ask, it's the platform you're developing um, content on the, the currency, or is it using blockchain somehow in real form? Yeah, so to maintain a blockchain, you need, an, you need some sort of an incentive structure. That incentive can uh, be <coughs> as a native crypto token, like Bitcoin is the token that's the economic incentive for Bitcoin. Um, but on the other hand, it can be just as simple as you and I want to continue doing business together, so our blockchain that we use to, I don't know, pass orders back and forth between each other, uh, we, we know that we're not going to defect because uh, we have that incentive to maintain that relationship. Uh, it may also work like um, a business arrangement where various companies in a sort of, um, uh, in, in order to onboard into the system, they put up some sort of surety bond or some sort of um, uh, deposit to where if they do defect, and then you'll see cryptographic proof that they defected, then they'll be legally liable to uh, lose that deposit they put down or uh, be able to be sued for damages elsewhere. It's, it's very much more um, mapping the trust model for your particular use case that makes sense. And um, as much as there may be some friction and pain points in the current systems, there's a reason that we've sort of built up uh, the way that we do business arrangements, and the way that we do custodial arrangements, and everything else, the way we, uh, the way it's been built up. Um, so I think we don't want to discard those lessons and that um, uh, that those regulatory frameworks and everything else. Instead, I think we can uh, just use blockchains to make that process a lot more transparent, a lot more uh, auditable, and allow you to um, then expose some of those functionalities to. Um, other parties at a very granular level so that you can still work together and connect these blockchains together without having to have shared infrastructure or shared secrets. Is it um, just using, say, uh, the example of um, taking up an escrow account, it, does it uh, offer the opportunity to get rid of uh, third parties? Because uh, I heard that one of the advantages is that, is that um, because you're automating the whole process and triggering, mm -hmm. you get rid of the third parties that might be charging or cooperating an escrow account. Well, again, it depends on the particular use case. Um, uh, Bitcoin, for example, um, <coughs> the proof of work and all the math surrounding that, there's some very nice mathematical. All you care about is bits moving around in the Bitcoin blockchain. <coughs> on the other hand, when you start caring about anything that happens in the real world, um, who has the title to my car? Uh, how many accounts do I have in my bank account? Um, that, that particular trust model goes out the window and doesn't have really anything to say about those relationships. Um, so instead you need to, um, you're still going to, for anything that deals with the real world, the outside world, you're still going to have to have some 
method of trusting that that's going to be delivered in the real world based on that escrow transaction. But what you can do is you can uh, you can start to unbundle those various aspects of trust and make them all contingent on the others so that, um, again, just like the whole point of escrow is the whole thing is atomic, either everything swaps or nothing swaps. Um, and uh, then you can make some make some assurances that the parties that are supposed to hold up their end of the bargain are indeed doing so, or at least they've given an audit trail of proof that uh, they've, they've um, claimed to do so. Uh, how, how significant is the fact that you Are you planning to scale up and move into larger economies such as the UK? And if you are planning to do so, what will be the barriers to kind of introduce that sort of platform? Yeah, I'll answer the first question and then we'll Brian have the second question. Um, uh, technical scalability, um, right now we're on our test nets, we're running a few thousand transactions a second for smaller networks. Um, for some of the um, Private networks are hoping to hit 100,000 transactions a second within the next 12 months. Uh, on the business scalability, right now we are uh, we we only have uh, we technically only have one customer signed and, and paid at the moment, but um, we're uh, late stage in the process of um, uh, putting together a few different initiatives. Uh, basically, where we're providing. Um, a base blockchain infrastructure level um, and working with other people in domain specific areas to provide that domain knowledge and provide that um, expertise that allows them to develop that, uh, that vertical and allows us to handle the parts we're good at, allows them to handle the parts they're experienced at. Actually, it's, it's the same thing with the, the government initiative. We're just providing uh, the base uh, blockchain layer and uh, the government is um, providing what their needs are and what the needs of the citizens are. Um, so as far as the jurisdictional scaling though, um, I, I, I know you have some thoughts on this one. Sure, uh, basically to your, to your point about, about the Isle of Man, uh, we, we see the Isle of Man as an enabling cluster. Um, so we have government's role is very much to provide um, the regulatory and the fiscal environment actually allow businesses to flourish like like next. Um, so from our perspective we see that all business is interconnected, all business is global. Um, so NICS need to expand the business and to have offices elsewhere. We recognize that that's that's that, that's part of that's part of our thinking. For us the important bit is that we actually establish all of the intellectual property, um, all all of the, the, the genesis of the group is actually established in the Isle of Man, which is where it all starts. Um, so what, what's in it for us is the idea of, of being an investment grade jurisdiction where smart people bring smart businesses to be protected both in terms of their intellectual property and both in terms of you know, when they ultimately trade sale or when they IPO. Um, there has to be a place where you can optimize uh, your, your corporate position. That, that place is the Isle of Man. So you know, we, we recognize that Nick will, will take uh, you know, the expansion Beyond the, beyond the shores of the island, I'm sorry. <coughs> I assume that the Isle of Man government is going to want some stuff in the blockchain itself for the regulation, so it's going to need some information yes, to so, get there. Yes. So how does that attach to the main blockchain? You know, so you've got the main blockchain and the access the information. We, we have our own. We have positive. Our, <coughs> sure. So if, 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 if you recall we made a government announcement some weeks ago to say that the government was uh, initiating a technical trial using blockchain but the data that we were using was data from the companies that are actually registering in the other man. So effectively it's our, it's our own blockchain in that sense. Yeah, in conjunction with Nick's, with Nick's company. Right, so it's not it's not going on the Bitcoin blockchain, it's going to be running on its own autonomous independent blockchain. It's um, a connection. So as the bit Bitcoin blockchain is going. Yeah. Some information going to go from that government blockchain. No. no, no, it'll just be independent. Uh, in the future, we um, and we're we're doing some exploratory stuff with connecting different blockchains together, um, and that's actually the whole the end goal for us is to have a bunch of independent 
but in interoperable uh, federated networks that can expose functionality and information and consume functionality and information from other blockchains or outside sources um, so that you can start linking those uh, federated bodies together. And um, I think that government services is an area where um, you can potentially see a large amount of value from exactly that model. One more question. <coughs> can you maybe touch base on the security of uh, side chains? Because uh, essentially, you have much less of computational power uh, to buy the security. Yeah, so computational power <coughs> only matters if you um, need anonymous validators, basically. Um, so if you onboard, um, and anonymous isn't necessarily even the technically the correct word, if you, because you can still have a proof of state network, for example, where people are technically anonymous, it's just that they have to be onboarded in some fashion, they needed to receive the token. Um, so if you're not worried about anonymous uh, validators, then all of a sudden um, you don't care about having um, so side chains is interesting because um, it, it says that you can have you can make this blockchain that allows you to use the Bitcoin token on this built from this blockchain, um, and in theory, if you can convince all the miners to mine on your chain, then you have the same security guarantees the Bitcoin network has. Um, however, in practice, um, I'm I'm not I'm. Personally, less confident that um, it's going to be quite as hunky dory. Um, it, it really seems to me, to be perfectly honest, really against the whole spirit of permissionless innovation, where you're putting your whole security model for any innovations you do in the space, based on being able to convince uh, the the, uh, the the cool kids in the playground to um, uh, not meet up on your network, basically. Oh. All right. Thanks, Thanks guys. Very much.